Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nadeem once again and I'm going to explore how we can or if it is even possible to mitigate OSS harm. So uh, just to give an introduction once again, uh, I do not speak tech, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I come from a media background and I currently run a non-profit organization called Citizen Digital Foundation out of Trivandrum, Kerala. Uh, I study the intersections of technology with society, politics, democracy, the people in general. So that's my area and I continue to learn in that aspect. This has been my background. I'm not sure if you can read uh, uh, this text about 20 years in the media uh, and some more spending like uh, with projects that I'm very close to I've worked with Syrian war refugees I've worked with uh, victims of uh, you know prostitution and uh, domestic abuse I have been on the ground with a lot of other volunteering activities as well um, my media background has largely been in content editorial marketing brand and those kinds of things uh, until I went and did my MBA at the age of 40 uh, in the UK where they don't teach you how to get the la latest you know, hot jobs although that's what I went with the objective of uh, instead they teach you how to be a responsible leader so that kind of aligned a lot with my ethical bug and uh, that's how Citizen Digital Foundation kind of came into me um, and this is a bit and please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn it's Nidhi Sudan that Citizen Digital Foundation, we're trying to uh, advocate the idea of safe and responsible technology for everyone. Practically, whatever magnificent tools that you folks create, uh, how it is used by businesses, how it is used by marketers, how it is used by politics, and what are the large scale impacts of that. And whether there is a duty or responsibility that lies with you. And to that, I will be uh, exploring some philosophical thoughts all of us in this room will fall on various spectrums of those philosophies. Uh, it's not necessary that there, there's no right or wrong. We'll all have different belief systems, so it's just an exploration therefore. Uh, we have taken, we practically take sessions, uh, end users uh, sessions are all about information literacy, what are the harms, what, what are the things, uh, cyber safety related things that you should know, online harassment, uh, fake news and things like that. We take a lot of sessions for uh, people in the government, uh, bureaucrats. We've also taken a session for the Kerala cabinet ministers. We talk about how these things have to be, you know, looked at from a governance point of view, not a regulation point of view, but regulation is a soft approach to that uh, under governance, but how to responsibly govern these things. Um, you must be familiar with this. Anyone seen this before? Yeah. That's the Liberator project, democratizing a handheld shotgun through open source because the code was put out there with uh, methods to print a gun and it was in the pockets of everyone. <laughs> that does not mean anything, but it essentially summarizes the aspect that what does open source mean to everyone, right? And let's bring it back to digital technologies. This must be something that you're familiar with already. Lama, of course, generative AI. Uh, it was meant to be given out to researchers, but it ended up also on 4chan. Everyone knows 4chan. It's one of the darkest corners of the internet, not a very happy place, at least for people who align with uh, a certain kind of values or human values. So uh, the open source community per se believes in certain values, right? And that's the idea, that's, that's why uh, all of you are here. And my media background does not have anything to do with tech. However, I espouse the value of openness and that is why I'm in this room. And uh, humans have all kinds of sides and shades and you know intentions that are driven by various other paradigms as well. We've seen the first contact of AI in internet, right? Internet, the idea of internet is to be open, to provide knowledge access, information access to everyone. And it's been one of the most potent tools that we've all witnessed and experienced in our development. However, it has also resulted in these pink spots. <coughs> we may have seen and read about it from the news or some of us may even have personal experiences when it comes to mental health crises or you know, fake news and things like that. But this was obviously not the objective, right? When founders of the big tech companies who created proprietary uh, products around that, the idea was to connect people. Uh, or 
make information and knowledge accessible to everyone make free speech an open concept everyone's story should be now heard and that was the idea of internet but how did it end up also amplifying a lot of negative things this does not mean that negative is the only thing uh, my job being a strategist and ai ethicist kind of a, a space Therefore, I talk about all these issues in much detail, and not. And if any of you have questions about any of these, these are all two-hour sessions that we take on each of those topics. So, how those things have worked out in the world and everything. So, I cannot get into that in the short span of time. But where is that, you know, dissonance happening? Who is doing this? You, when you sit and code, and you, when you sit and create products, that's the last thing on your mind. You don't want to create genocides. You don't want to create election engineering. You don't want the first contact of AI for humanity to be misused in the first place. So what are those motives that come into play? Let's look at a few examples, and that's where the big tech politics comes in. Uh, and this is nothing against the people who run it as much as the market that motivates them to do, go in a certain direction. We know the market pa paradigm is all about incentivizing growth. And what is growth? Profits. How do profits happen? You reward shareholders who invest in your company. In the process, often stakeholders, all the other stakeholders, which is consumers, employees, people out there, environment, planet-related things, everything gets sidelined because it's money, money, money that's driving the thing. So let's look at this. Have you heard of this? L-A-I-O-N. <coughs> Artificial Intelligence Open Network. This is a non-profit organization that curates and collects all the visual and text and all kinds of data. Please correct me if I'm wrong because I may not have the right vocabulary to uh, justify the kind of work that they do. They are basically the training database that people like OpenAI, Google Imagine and all of them use to train their models. So this is where an ethical dissonance happens. You have all these uh, you know, training data available at, for non-profit pur purposes, for researchers to access, for uh, you know, trainers to kind of work on it and see what the possibilities of uh, technology can be. Uh, and OpenAI was a non-profit up until 2020, where their uh, uh, you know statement very clearly said that you know we we do not want financial obligations to stop us from developing things for humanity. So what happens when suddenly a non-profit turns into a for-profit? And why do they turn into a non-profit? Uh, what happened was Stability AI came in and took DALI away because it's open source. And they made products which could then be accessed by a larger community. So OpenAI was holding on to DALI because they said that it's not safe to put it out yet. There has to be more training, more development, more research to be done. But Stability AI, because it was open source, they came in and they democratized it, made it accessible for many people to use. Absolutely fine. But what OpenAI then lost out was a lot of financial opportunity there. And that's when they decided that with chat GPT, they're not going to do that. So they came out and they, they, of course, there was a deal with Microsoft and then they became a for-profit and there was a whole lot of financial uh, blame. Now, these are the big eagles. Then there are small eagles who want to make uh, hay when the sun shines. Getty Images went and sued Stability AI for using Getty Images database to train their tools. Getty Images did not sue them because of co copyright issues, although in, in on paper it is about copyright, right? But at the end of the day, when two big companies clash, they're not literally going to shut a stability AI or an open AI. Instead, what happens is they end up in settlement. So they get money out of it. So when you get money out of a big thing that's going on, that's about it. Because why, why is that? Because Getty Images did not take down stability AI, nor did it take down Google Images. They had sued Google Images long back. But Google Images did not die, right? Google Images continues. But Getty Images gets money, money out of it. Same way Google Books was also sued for uh, intellectual property rights because they're literally scraping all the books uh, available, right? And that's copyright and intellectual property issue. So these are the politics and games that happen over there. End users do not figure in there. When it comes to the open source community, largely the, the idea is about developing responsibly, right? And you want to do it for the good. It's when Businesses or proprietary software developers or bad and malicious actors step in that often the perverse incentives step in. And uh, before I get into possible solutions, I actually want to also address the perverse incentive bit, bits uh, that we just mentioned. Uh, where you philosophically stand or where your values or ethics stand practically drives a lot of things. So zero day exploits are a huge, huge market for not just big tech companies, but also governments. So he spoke about threat intelligence. Uh, 
So there's this expert, cybersecurity expert from I think Homeland Security US called Nicole Perlroth. She's spoken in a podcast where she says that there are these conferences that happen and this was also news to me, I never knew that these things happen. There are conferences that happen where all the big governments get together and then they approach or find out hackers who sit in Argentina and you know places in Philippines and all that and their only motive is to make money. And a US would pay a hacker or a zero day exploit expert about 2.5 billion dollars to do a zero day exploit on all their security tools. And why? Because they don't want their security systems to be attacked by an external power, China, right? Geopolitics, all those kinds of things. <laughs> However, Saudi Arabia would pay the same hacker 3.5 billion. You know why? They don't perceive threat from an external country. They perceive threat from their own people. They want to surveil their own people. So they will pay more money to a, to a, to a hacker to have their own people surveilled, which is why Democracies, autocracies, they all function dif uh, differently. If you go to China, you will be constantly surveilled. There are lots of geopolitical elements around that. So this is basically a power politics and, you know, uh, that kind of a game. Coming back to what open source community can do about it. Again, there are no one answers in one room. Uh, one thing that is explored by a few experts in the area is whether it should be fully open accessibility or closed licenses. That practically means that Either you make especially generative AI tools publicly accessible, which means that A, there is much less compute required, less server space required, and you know, you would know all those kinds of things better. Anybody can now carry a Liberator project in their pocket with generative AI, and that's already happening. Pentagon Blast has literally brought the stock markets down. The, the pictures of Pentagon Blast in the news in India, it started with Republic TV, in the US also many news channels carry, and that brought the trade market stocks down and, um, of many companies and the market as such. So this has financial implications, this has healthcare implications at a large, large scale. So the other option is whether it should be closed licenses. So even as an open source community when you're developing something, should there be a trademarking to identify where the provenance of the software is? Provenance essentially means that who is using your software and what they're doing it is basically recorded in some form so you know that if something goes wrong you can track it down. Could that be an option? There was a poll conducted, this was a basic push poll on LinkedIn uh, by, by the same expert who spoke about it. They said that most people agree that open source with regulations is where possibly the solution lies with generative AI technology. The other solution that I uh, found was ethical sourcing. Are you familiar with this? I'm sure you're familiar with this. The idea here is as an open source community, when you build something, you are saying that this is the potent tool that I've built, but I cannot keep track of who uses it and how and why, because there's so many co companies and people using my software. But ethical sourcing is it literally concerns itself with how, with how uh, you know, the tool is used. So the measurement is not based on the number of adoptions. The measurement is based on the nature of the adoption downstream. So this could be possibly. These are just thoughts I'm putting out in the open for you to also, you know, kind of have discourses on. Which brings me to the philosophy. Uh, it all comes down to where our, uh, you know, ethics philosophy lies. Uh, it's going to get a little uh, academic or boring here, but utilitarianism. Have you heard of that? This is basically consequentialism. This is uh, this was first spoken about by Jeremy Bentham, he's an English philosopher. The idea is you judge the judge by the consequence of the action. Simple example, stealing. Stealing is not right. As a value, everybody's taught that stealing is not a good thing. But if it was a poor man who stole because he was hungry and he needed food and his family was dying, then is that legitimized? So then utilitarianism says that the consequences of the action should be the way to judge it. So the consequences that was that uh, the family was fed and they survived, so it was okay. The action is therefore justified. The end justifies the means. The ontology, which was Immanuel Kant's philosophy, talks about sticking to the duty. Whatever it is, you stick to your duty, your law. So if law says, I think uh, somebody gave the example of what uh, piracy is illegal, but then there are ways around it and, and what justifies that will not be a utilitarianism or you know a consequential bit that will come into play but you're saying that piracy is wrong as such it should not be done at a, uh, under any cost but we, we know that there are ways around that right so the same thing with so what are the kind of uh, institutions that follow the ontology uh, military a soldier just follows their duty uh, similarly law when we stick to the law we know that it's just the law nothing else matters however it uh, you know impacts people it does not matter this is what i will be concerned and the final one, one is Virtue Ethics uh, by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. 
so there it, it values the purpose as in it's not about the action what you do and what the outcome is instead what is the purpose of it and how would a virtuous person do it so let's say if i'm about i'm given a dilemma an ai dilemma as such and i have to take a call i'd say that what would mahatma gandhi do or, i don't know for mlk junior do should they be my hero i don't know or there would be people who would say what would putin do or a hitler do fair enough i mean it's entirely you know their philosophical drives that finally makes a call on anything there are people there are all kinds of people that exist so at that point i just want to leave it and uh, if i have like 10 minutes i want to explore a little activity if, if I, sure sure uh, <coughs> okay so uh, this is just an anonymous poll and i'll only get to see uh, the uh, percentages would you mind scanning this and whoever wants to participate can just uh, oh sorry just to see how it works in ai there's some hot pictures for you to rate as practically the assignment <laughs> Microsoft and AI is built. So there are the scores from Google and Microsoft AI. 
100% with you on that. 5 out of 5, this is sexier. So this was a study That's recently great. done by Gianluca Moro of AI Accountability Network and The Guardian. This is definitely not hot. All right, next, 5 out of 5 with you on that. 98% that. Again, this, 5 out of 5, 100%. Five out of five, 98%. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the point is made, right? I don't have to establish it further that there has to be. And this, how does this pan out? Most rooms ask me, you guys are techies, so you won't ask me this, but how does it pan out? Shadow banning, uh, virtually, you know, uh, giving a lot of meanings around what a woman's legitimate point of view is or a non binary person's point of view is, uh, gets overshadowed by how they look or appearances. When it comes to like this was a gender example there are examples around caste uh, you know race and everything how your loans are rejected how jobs get uh, you know panned out if you have a beard and a brown skin when you travel and you're in an airport uh, i believe there is an example of nypd now setting up uh, snitch bots as they're called uh. Coming up, switch bots. They are in, uh, they are at uh, Times Square and uh, New York subways, basically armed with AI, uh, which practically targets people and decides who is prone to crime. So, if you're not white, Caucasian, male, then the chances of you being incriminated would be higher. So, these are all implications of how AI would pan out if it is not. So, I'm sure all of you have read uh, Coders, but I would really recommend this book. Called Weapons of Math, Math Destruction, if you haven't read, or Algorithms of Oppression by Safiya Noble. So, yeah, that's about it. That's my time. Any questions? Uh, not a question. Yeah. Uh, I would like to add up a thing Please. called, there's a thing that exists called Lana Image. You can uh, search it, it exists in the academy and computer science academy. In research papers, you can't use the face of a particular woman. You can, uh, Check it on Google. It's called Lana Image. It's, it's yeah, like banned in IEEE papers. Okay. Everything. There's a reason for that. It's it's related to female, male. I'm noting that down. Lana Image, right? Lana. 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 So L E N A. <coughs> okay. So. Huh. Any other thoughts? Uh, have you, has anyone explored these areas before? And any ideas? Any breakthroughs? I would love to hear and learn. Yeah, like for, how can open eye work from non profit to for profit? Is there any kind of law against that? Like any company can do that, right? Uh, you actually can. Legally, you can switch from a non profit to a for profit. I don't think anything stops you, but uh, the FTC in the US and people like that will actually monitor based on several anti competitive theories and things uh, whether you should or not. But unfortunately, anti competitive practices and lots of those legal uh, rules that apply for organization switching apply in a non-tech and a much smaller uh, you know uh, market share kind of a thing for uh, for what is classified as really large digital platforms it took the uh, eu's or yeah eu's digital services act and digital markets act to define that uh, so there are 17 platforms including google facebook all of them that will be uh, now uh, you know uh, treated under these large service providers and therefore the rules will apply differently to them from how it applied to previous companies but it is still taking time these laws are catching up so really you can't prevent an organization from turning from a non-profit to a for-profit there are mechanisms uh, for them to do that and like the all these companies are based off on open source price itself so like even open AI, like yes. the code is all GPL. Yeah. So why 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 aren't the people suing it? Like I'm seeing two so different sides yes, to that. Those like, clauses don't exist, so it can't be sued. So yes, they are being sued on IP and copyright. Right. That's the only thing that they are being sued on. There is no other clause that they fall under. So again, people who sue them are things like uh, organizations like Getty Images who will say that you have used our database. But at the end of the day, the outcome of the case won't be that OpenAI will have to stop a chat GPT or a Dali. They can't stop it. The only outcome is that uh, Getty Images will get a settlement out of it. And that's it. And then, so the technologies kind of evolve and we adapt to it. So that's how we know that Google Images and Google Books exist and they are of value to us, but they are now expected to follow certain uh, laws and rules around how you will not be infringing upon people's labor and people's, uh, you know, whatever they've created. If they've written books, you can't just blankly give it across to everyone because that's that person's livelihood as such. 
so the same will come around so the law has to catch up and kind of you know redraft some of those things and uh, then tell open ai that you cannot use it for certain purposes but the game there again it's a big game right so uh, if you happen to hear at least glimpses of sam altman's uh, hearing he was very very clear in the us senate that there should be regulation but just yesterday he said that we're not going to be in the eu because eu regulation is hard so there is all that is power play like i'm seeing one on select like, there some people are saying there should be no copyright at all yeah. and everyone should be free to uh, uh, right. store books or right? right so they're saying that open i did this with gpl code fine yeah. but yeah. that should be applied for everyone as well like anybody can use anything that's where the philosophy thing comes in so some of the artists are the ones who are uh, saying that you know ai is taking away our work and our hard earned labor and if ai is going to generate content then i'm not going to be so that i think with other uh, uh, ip and content related things there are people who put robots.txt yeah. on their website so that they shouldn't be scraped or their material should not be scraped the same is being demanded by creative people that you know or artists or musicians but on the other side what you said is similar to what grimes is saying as anybody know the musician or the artist grimes yeah, yeah, who yeah, is elon musk's ex wife she's saying that use my content make generative content out of my uh, you know whatever art it is but give me 50% So that's a different philosophy. It's fine. She is giving consent for her art to be used that way. So there should be probably all these philosophies should have room in uh, you know how we function is probably what. But without permission, I cannot take even Grimes's art. You know that that's essentially the thing. So which philosophy you belong to, there should be clear. So if I say that my art cannot be copied by ChatGPT or uh, Dali, then I should have an equivalent of a watermarking or a robots.txt or some sort uh, being available in all of my digital. But then that will again limit knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the this is the uh, this is the dilemma. It's not a sol- there is no solution. It's a dilemma, and these are complex and wicked problems. That's how these are defined, right? Complicated problems are what practically all of you deal with, where you can look at all the permutations, combinations, and arrive at a solution. A Boeing seven or seven, a Swiss watch, everything is programmed, and you can arrive at a solution. But when it comes to things that interact with society, art, uh, philosophy, science, people, planet. there is no absolute solution it's always dilemmas that can be managed so yes how do we find uh, you know so there is no global solution universal fix some people are talking about global universal governance for ai it may not be a solution because the, the last time we saw that with social media what they tried to do was build a global public square things went crazy right what you can say a kardashian lifestyle can empower people in the us but it will not do that in a up or a Uh, I don't know a uh, war ridden Yemen. It will be completely, probably even uh, shocking to them. So global public square doesn't work. Similarly, in my opinion, a uh, uh, universal law may not work. It has to be very, very country specific. And also, some countries are talking about how servers should be in our place, data should be stored, so stored in order. But unfortunately, then the other power is the government. Depends entirely on government's motives as to what they want to do with that data. If they are not working in the citizens' interest, then this is also equally toxic. So the solution lies in developers thinking responsibly, and of course, people and non-tech end users being much more informed. And we interact a lot with non-tech end users, right? You folks know so much. I mean, Aditya talked about how you literally use an old phone camera to build a dashboard and a webcam, and I'm like, what? Duh. <laughs> yeah. So non-tech end users are, are at such a huge disadvantage. I'll tell you an example. I was trying to, I'm trying to work with Thinker Hub to do a hackathon. Uh, to come up with a tool that will help predict fake news not absolutely declare that this is fake news or not fake news but at least give an indication that this has uh, hate speech content this has manipulative content or something like that so that news rooms can work with that now they'll be pummeled with uh, you know, generative ai content coming to their news desk and manually journalists won't be able to make out the difference we even saw the saw the pope in parka jacket image used on 24 news Uh, during Easter or something, so it's it's that normal. So basically, what I'm coming to is at the end of the day, uh, uh, bringing media and technology together in a room so you speak to each other and come with solutions is a very difficult task. That's what CDF is trying to do. You folks are great at what you do. The journalists and media people are excellent at what they do. Social scientists are great at what they do. But we're all working in silos. We're not talking to each other. And I saw in Trivandrum, you know, hackathon students come. Sorry, I'll just take this one. Uh, students coming up with uh, solutions like great working tools called depresso meter or suicide prevention app the ux and ui are excellent but have you spoken to somebody who can, who's right. actually going through mental health crisis they of course are coming up with a problem statement because they've seen somebody in their family and genuinely feel about the issue 
but without understanding that you know person who is in the mentality or a, a mind space of uh, uh, you know considering something like suicide may not be looking at how cool your ux and ui is so that is the gap that we need to build and you know let's speak to each other and, yeah which is why i'm really glad that uni has come out and uh, you know she's joined something like this but we need to speak to all kinds of people students different genders and understand the problems and bring solutions to them so yeah uh, the media school students who are working on the hackathon uh, basically they're not able to understand how to work with google sheets and that kind of absence of digital skilling while they are excellent journalism students and people who understand social sciences this is not going to be a solution we need to upskill them on tech and we need to get all of you in rooms to talk to each other is my ultimate message is all anything else that uh, you mentioned about we, we talked about how governments and regulation should be enforced right? so do you think that capitalism adds a lot of more like it's essentially a roadblock to having the ecosystem where each function can talk to each other because that that can be lobbying from corporate that can be pressure from big companies right so uh, what do you think we can do that okay. so again this is something that you you touched upon a very very uh, macro issue that many experts in the space are talking about i'm studying that as part of uh, tech stewardship as well as uh, center for human technology has a foundations course they they talk about small changes that we can make are probably at ux and the business levels but the ultimate change that we need to make is shifting the market paradigm because if capitalism is going to reward and like you rightly said if google is in the race with microsoft to put out more you know ai empowered tools despite all their ethics despite all their responsible practices yeah. microsoft is known for being the benchmark in responsible ai practices they've kept everything aside because it's what is called called a multipolar trap which is basically if i don't do it somebody else will and they'll win so i don't want to be left out that's the basic human psychology that it's being tapped into so unless the so the alternatives that uh, people are talking about is cooperative models platform cooperatives where you are bringing and you, what you reward should not be based on what the market is rewarding you for so that's the perverse incentive bit so if you are uh, for example social media rewards hateful content there's 17 to 24% more visibility and virality for hateful disgusting emotional text so there are images that i could probably later share with you so why is that happening because if you target people's primal instincts they will spend longer time on your platform and therefore that's engagement therefore advertising and that's the market paradigm that you're feeding into whereas uh, your vision is connecting people bringing knowledge to people so your vision uh, stays somewhere and your metrics are redefining something else right so it won't happen till the market paradigm changes and there are lots of people like i think this I think I'm getting the name wrong. Mondrager, Foundation—they're uh, all cooperative businesses that also thrive. So instead of the unicorn model, there is zebra model that is advocated because unicorn is again an exploitative market model where only one uh, entity is being pushed towards the one billion mark, and VCs will look for that kind of potential, while all the other successful businesses might not get that kind of funding. Why is that? So it's a competitive thing, right? Simple, simple, simple example: Amul. So, if you look at industrial milk production, they literally, you know, feed the cows with hormones and stuff like that, and they, uh, the the suction pumps that are used on cows bring out the blood and pus from the milk. And there are FDA regulations that say that this much percentage of blood and pus in milk is okay for humans, only because they're creating demand around a few cows. But what Milma and Amul do are they bringing or they created a, a, a grid or a network, what was known as the milk grid of India, basically connecting the cows that are already there and the farmers that are producing milk to the people who require it. So the cooperative model is something that's often said as a solution to the capitalistic uh, extractive model. Capitalism at per se needn't be bad, but when it gets to growth <coughs> plus narrow problem solving equals exploitation. So that's the cut off point. when the vision is lost yes you're right this is a long game none of us again in this room can uh, solve but we can think in these directions so i mean one thing you can see about capitalism is that in europe for example they have really gone ahead and done all these privacy laws they've been standing up against uh, facebook and google and all this because you see all the way happening right now so right so we can maybe learn from that and i think a lot of countries in from india and all that we were actually basically copy basing a lot of our laws from the eu but there is a there is a bad side to that because we know that uh, the eu is a very responsible actor in terms of data 
Right? But not the Indian government no. versus. You, that's what they you said. All actors need to be equal. So I, I'm having the same problem right now. Like when I'm trying to do like international studies, uh, like between the US, even the US, the same problem. You know, if I want to share data with uh, academic researchers in Canada, it's very difficult. Right? And I'm trying to get data out of India to the US and Canada. Can't do it. There's a whole bunch of laws. They say, no, there's certain laws with the RBI. Oh, yeah, I need certain permission for that. And that letter is like stuck for the last six months over there. <laughs> and the business arm twisting, right? Google has yeah. rolled out BARD into 180 countries, but not EU. Yeah. So EU yeah. will be at a disadvantage if they don't get AI. But it's a small, without saying, they're saying that your regulation is too tough. We're not going to come to your countries. So what will happen? EU will be left out of the AI race. Now they'll soften the regulation, possibly. So these are like arm uh, wrestling things happening at really large levels. We don't know whether it's going to be nice. Right, so. Uh, one, yeah. So this is about the bars that you talked yeah. about. So uh, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah. So uh, it can be a bug as well, right? So we are talking about bugs and uh, it can be a technology, a technology limitation as well, which will be eventually be fixed. Should be. Uh, as long as there are vested interests who don't want it fixed, it won't be fixed. And this is not a male, female kind of a thing. But what happens is when you have practically people who decide, uh, I mean, or you know, the representation of people who are writing code and the teams who are developing code, being a single kind of uh, shape. Uh, and this is again, uh, people like Timnit Gebru and all of them point out that there are not enough black representation. Forget brown and yellow representation. Like Indians, thankfully, we have a strong tech community, but Indian representation is also not there in the data unless we are developing it here in India. So uh, Southeast Asian data is amply available in Chinese software and in you know software that's developed in those countries, but not in US. And if you have a Google OpenAI and all those big companies using the existing data that's available there and shipping products here, then like if I may just call out one small little thing, I think it was Aditya's presentation or Mufi's presentation, I don't remember, where all the babies' images that was used were all white babies. Even, even as a joke, <laughs> <laughs> there is really no harm in that. But the thing is, uh, if you saw Malayalam news oh, recently, yeah. they had uh, right Alan it's or it's Ethan, an AI character, say news, oh, right? 24, I think. 24 and some of the other Media news. one also. Right? Correct. So that there is no harm as such. We also like a white person speaking. Malayalam has a major uh, you know, <laughs> But it has other connotations when it comes to healthcare and law enforcement and jobs and uh, you know financial services and all that. So if you have, uh, uh, let's say, so now if a loan is rejected uh, based on whatever records of mine are available in the organization, I can speak to a human person who's you know uh, and ask why it was rejected. They might give me a very convincing answer and I can go home. But what happens is when it's written into uh, you know, the, the AI tools that will then be uh, disseminating these. Uh, services, you cannot ask. You will assume that there's something wrong, which happened with the Amazon algorithm that the ATS algorithm, if you're familiar, was rejecting women's resumes for a long time and nobody knew why was it happening. Is anyone familiar with that? The applicant tracker system of Amazon for about 10 years or 9 years or so was rejecting women's application purely by the gender, uh, you know, uh, bit of it. So you know that they have ATSs before humans uh, get to the resumes, right? Because the data was trained on all the successful candidates of the past being male. Until somebody found out the bug and kind of highlighted that. So imagine the number of jobs that were lost and also the representation in the company that was lost. Again, I'm coming back to gender, but this is not just gender. It applies to race, caste, religion, what my parents did. If my parents' uh, crime record of some sort is, or my family's crime record is registered somewhere, tomorrow I might be rejected for a college application and I won't know why. It's possible, it's happening in places, and which is why when uh, a lot of technologists are highlighting these <coughs> kinds of bugs and these can be created, I mean, uh, can be resolved, it won't get resolved unless you have the other story also sitting in the room and saying that no, this is not how you do. Uh, there is a great framework, but I'm sorry I'm uh, suggesting a corporate framework, but this is actually an AI, uh, AI blind spot spotting uh, framework which addresses the four uh, stages of any tech development. This was developed by MIT and Berkman Klein Institute, which talks about how at each stage you should have data representation, team representation, checking process, measurement process, evaluation process. It gives a guideline for any organization 
to follow to set these preventive protocols. Now again, when I say preventive protocols, I have to quickly give you an example. Cyber security, right? You spoke about cyber security and that's something now we understand the dangers of. But we don't understand the dangers of AI bias so much. Earlier when you uh, used to build uh, buildings, nobody set these fire safety systems in place beforehand. Today we make it part of the construction process of the building. You have to set smoke alarms in place because what you're preventing is a fire and therefore data loss, life loss, infrastructure loss and cost which will be accrued at that point. Now we know that we can save those costs. Fires might still break out but the uh, intensity might be much lesser. It's not that it's going to completely stop fires. Um, there might be somebody who will foolishly make something there and you know and just catch fire. It could happen but there are systems that would prevent that. So this makes, there is a cost to setting fire prevention systems in a building, but that cost is better than having a loss cost later. So these are governance protocols. It's called the Collingridge's dilemma in uh, AI ethics. The point where you decide. So if you're a new startup, you won't have the finances to uh, kind of include safety protocols because I have a lot of friends who, have, you know, who run startups now and I'll say that why don't you consider cyber safety assessment, risk assessment, AI assessment. They're like, we don't have the budget for that. Why would we do that? And no law requires us to do that, so we won't do that. Because it doesn't make sense financially in the short term. But when, and like Mark rightly said, if an EU regulation is now suddenly adapted into our Digital India Act, which right now Rajiv Chandrasekhar, uh, our Minister for Information and Technology, is working on, if that comes to play, every company will be scrambling for compliance. And you know, we have to stick because it's, it's a law asking us to. But you're not thinking of the cost you could have saved if you put it in earlier. It's not an easy decision for any organization to take, which is why again it's called the Colin Ridge's dilemma. At what stage of your organization's growth do you include uh, safety protocols and what it? Uh, so there are teams who do that, and there's going to be major job uh, roles that will come up in AI ethics and you know these kinds of things, risk assessment of AI and stuff. So that's an area that possibly we can. Sorry, did that answer your question? Not to a large extent, I know, but yeah. But I don't know, it's like regulation is like, uh, it, it just adds more barriers to entry if you think about it. Yes, it's hard players, regulation. You know, if you're trying to do startups and all that, if there is so much barrier, if you think about fintech in India, for example, there are significant barriers to entry. You're not seeing so as many fintech, fintechs as you think you would see, even though we have a lot of these uh, uh, wonderful infrastructure built up. That there is a cost involved to it. Even if you think about it, gatekeepers are still the banks if you want to access the main systems, right? And they put up, and they have to comply with the RBA regulation. Yeah. And that costs come down to us, right? Like people are saying, all the security, I mean, kind of audits, those costs. Yes. There's a lot of year to do quarterly audits, those will cost us about $100,000, $150,000. And the, which startup can manage that kind of cost, right? Absolutely. But fintech is a high risk sector. But I'm well. just saying, even for things like uh, AI, I mean, there are going to be costs yes, involved definitely. with, and I think, I, I personally think that the industry is going to lobby against it. Personally. Industry is going to lobby because That's what we're yeah, seeing in so EU. we're going to see that because we don't want to stay behind in innovation, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And that is what even Kerala, as such, when we speak to uh, you know government bodies, they are very clear that we want to prioritize innovation. Responsibility comes later. So yeah. that is the thing. It's just that. Now the AI camera. What is that? AI camera. Now they have, so they have a AI camera set up at every road everywhere. Probably the camera is made in China. That's what is going to come straight to Kerala. That's quite important. And I've even heard some of the officials speak at conferences who handle projects like eHealth that we can also monetize this data, that Aadhaar data that all of us would have been, have to be giving online for e-health services. We can monetize it by selling it for insurance, insurance companies. companies yeah. Wait, how can you say that? Because you don't have GDPR. You, you, because so, people don't understand this. The government already solved the vehicle. Yes, yes, yes. So we are already. living in a situation which is all cacophony, I think, at, at this point. But I'm, I'd also like to take that point that it, it should pan out. Uh, we are new to this system. Uh, we are all adapting to how these things uh, you know, impact all of us. It should pan out in a few years. It's just that we should mitigate harm in the process. And it should not always be one <coughs> the underprivileged or the less privileged who are losing out. So I always give the Titanic example for this. If Titanic is this fancy technology, it also represents all the social device that you see on land. So somebody with a cheaper ticket will get a basement and the uh, expensive tickets are all up top. But it's all good when the ship is sailing smooth. 
when the ship goes down it's the poor man that dies first it's fine but even those covered in cushy satin uh, clothes will go down it's just a little later unless they escape to mars they'll still die <laughs> <laughs> which is why some people want yeah. to go to mars but i don't know how long that will uh, that survival rate and everything how much fun would it be would people party on mars i don't know what are your thoughts i think the 2012 movie i think that kind of movie the 2012 movie, yeah, yeah. Uh, end good. of the world yeah. movie, yes, yeah. and only rich people gets on a boat. Yeah. 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 And uh, don't look up. There are so many uh, dystopian movies and all those. Uh, I think don't look up captures that very well. Don't like look they, up captures yeah. that very well. Yeah, that's right. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.